I just wanted to uh, say on behalf of the organisers that we're very uh, happy to see people back in person after the pandemic. So we've had a couple of years where we've run these meetings online, but it's great to see people back here in person. And I hope you've enjoyed the opportunity to interact with people. Uh, so the pandemic has sort of uh, been an interesting experience in many ways, but I think we would all agree there's been another um, epidemic, and that is an epidemic of structure prediction and computational methods. So uh, we're very pleased to have a session um, in that area. And who better to start that session but the uh, lead author on the paper, John Jumper, uh, from, I thought, is it DeepMind? Is there another bit incorporated or? It's sometimes DeepMind Technologies Limited, I think, but let's just go with DeepMind. Okay, right. Over <laughs> to you then, John. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be speaking here about the uh, more beneficial epidemic. I think we can all agree. Um, and uh, I'll be talking a bit about, of course, AlphaFold. And I realize now looking at the title, its implications for understanding biology is, is maybe an area where many people in the room are more, are more expert and should be talking about it rather than me, but I'll do my best and hope to give some kind of signposts about where I think uh, the field may be going in the next few years. And so, of course, you've heard uh, AlphaFold and, and kind of the way I like to think about it, the cheesy joke I like to make of it is that it, it does computational alchemy. That, uh, that it takes the uh, base metal of protein sequences, right, easily and cheaply obtainable, and uh, alchemically transforms it into the uh, gold of structural biology. And uh, being able to do this at scale is really important. I think also really interesting for what it means about what kind of other problems we may be able to solve. And so, of course, one of the really, really important parts about the story has been uh, CASP, the organization and, uh, and critical assessment that's run every two years. And what's really important about uh, CASP has been uh, really two things. One that's very, very, very important is that it's blind, that uh, the uh, participating groups uh, have to do it as if it's a, uh, as if, you know, certainly credibility is on the line, and really have to, can use whatever methods they want because they don't know the answer. They can only tweak uh, toward the answer if they have a generally useful method. And then I think the other really important part is that it's been tremendously aligning, that it's for the entire field defined a concrete instance of the problem. People think that absolutely the most important thing in ML is training data, and I would argue that that's the second most important. The most important part is evaluation, that really saying what you want, being able to measure how you're doing, critically being able to measure when you're a little bit closer to your goal, have, but haven't yet achieved it. And CASP has really been a aligning force for that and really an enabler for all the methods in the field and for comparing them and for having confidence in them. And of course, you know, now people, biologists have used it, have used it for real tasks, and it's proven that this assessment was correct, that it is a very useful system. As you well know, there's the AlphaFold uh, protein structure database. So we launched it with uh, predictions for the for 21 model organisms, uh, proteomes, about 330,000 predictions. It now includes 200 million predictions. So pretty much uh, everything in Uniprot. And we do uh, plan to continue improving and expanding, but it's this enormous resource we hope that it will enable what I would consider, you know, structural metaproteomics, enable large scale studies. I think really exciting, not just how AlphaFold can be used in place of one experiment, but how can you think about using it in place to understand differences within families, differences over evolution. I think we'll still see those to come, genome mining, et cetera. Now, how AlphaFold works and the kind of picture in the picture, certainly in this all predates us in terms of uh, great work in the field, right? There's you know, I, I was trained as a physicist. And so the physicist lo loves the left hand of this diagram, right? You know, the infants and Leventhal, the amino acid sequence through the power of physics and Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics gives us an energy landscape of which the structure that you would find deposited in the PDB is the approximate free energy minima, except for all the exceptions um, of that. And 
this picture and you know you can think of this as like molecular dynamics uh, folding simulations everything else kind of within solidly within this framework and it's very valuable it's a great way to understand it but we haven't been able to make this work right and alpha fold can go a little bit further but for most cases vast majority of cases it can't do what you would consider i guess physics or physical folding and so instead we've uh, turned evolution and we've said oh well okay the structure has a causal relationship, has a causal effect on evolution via function, right? Structure tends to be preserved over long, approximately preserved over long evolutionary time frames, And so there's been a lot of work on coevolution and contacts and all that, but I think it's better to take maybe a larger kind of Bayesian approach that, well, if I know that A caused these outcomes B, well, if I look at all the Bs, maybe I can infer something about A. And so this is, in essence, I would consider the basis of um, proper kind of structure prediction from evolution. And I used to call it Bayesian, but then I talked to a statistics department, and I was uncomfortable calling it Bayesian, so I call it pseudo-Bayesian. Um, but this type of perspective has been very powerful, but still very difficult, that for most, for the vast majority of cases, you didn't solve structures in this way. And when the kind of information that you were able to extract from evolution was very coarse. Right, and so you weren't able to solve certainly uh, highly accurate atomic resolution structures. Now, the other story that, of course, no one uh, is able to miss is that deep learning has been doing incredible things over the past few years. And one way to think about this is deep learning gives us this incredible toolkit for modeling weird complex functions, and it's incredibly general. So people have you know, deep learning based systems are able to write text, they're able to process audio, they're able to tell you if something is a cat image, right? It's so, they're so generic that they're too generic, that if you want to think about the kind of things that have been developed, they're incredible ideas and gadgets, but they don't know anything about proteins. So when you want to use them pr to predict protein structure, if you try and take these out of the box and out of the box transformer, it doesn't work to predict protein structure. It would probably work if the PDB were 100 times as big or 1,000 times as big. But, they, but since the PDB is extremely precious and, and small by machine learning uh, scales, we need to inject more of what we understand about proteins into the design of the deep learning system. That really is necessary. And the story of AlphaFold is how injecting our kind of understanding or kind of pulling the right elements of our scientific understanding of protein physics and evolution and geometry and putting it into the design of the neural network makes something dramatically more data efficient and thus reaches the size of the data that we have available. And so we have some principles, and I would say there are a tremendous number of detailed ideas, but we're trying to say, what are the principles? Building these insights into the network structure, what we did in AlphaFold 1, what is really um, kind of the common approach in the field was, we'll build a complex protein system, and in the middle, we will drop an extremely standard neural network. And that approach does help. It, it was the basis of state-of-the-art systems, including our first AlphaFold system, but it didn't really take us near where we needed to be. We instead started saying, well, no, we're going to put all these ideas into the design of the network. We're going to build this end-to-end. -end. On one side will come in raw genetic sequences, say from the MSA. Output will be protein structure, such that when the answer is wrong, that you get a clear signal in how to change the parameters to improve it. And then we did a lot of things to really emphasize, I would say, tertiary structure and understanding tertiary structure as it develops through the network. So how do we build in, kind of de-emphasize primary sequence, don't look so much at that and build an emphasis of the spatial structure. And that, that's highly technical, so I won't go too much into it. And how do you handle uncertainty? Of course, this big complex network, um, we consider it the most complex network we've built at, uh, at, Deep, at Deep Mind. I think it's, you know, it is typical that kind of systems which are aimed entirely at accuracy do tend to be more complex than uh, demonstration systems, but it is very complex. But where this knowledge goes in is in this EVO former, exactly how we process representations of the MSA and representations of the spatial structure as, as thought of in terms of pairs, how we process those, and then how we process explicit geometry and many other innovations are what we use to build structure and of course confidence measures around those structures. Now, in a, in a higher level sense, what do we think are the principles? Um, and some of these I should say are, you know, there are intentions when you build the system 
And then you need to go back and figure out if it matched your intentions. And I think of deep learning a little bit, you know, people hold it, hold kind of computational methods to a very high standard that you should think deep thoughts, write down very precise equations, and then and then have it work the first time. And of course, it doesn't work like that. It work, it looks like, for example, experimental biology, where you have hypotheses and then you refine your hypotheses as your experiments don't work or as uh, as the solution crashes out. And so this kind of, and so we built an intuition and then we went back and investigated the behavior of the system, looked at things within it and got kind of, we think a lot of what we tried to build, we achieved. One thing to say is that the global structure of the protein is more, it's more like NMR than cryo-EM or crystallography, that we think that it's finding kind of locally correct interactions, it's understanding local hackings, and the global structure arises from connecting together all this kind of local uh, interpreted information, which makes sense, of course, for example, physics is local. And because of that, if you look at, and you really should, if you work with alpha fold structures, oh yeah, I can point this way. You really, no, not very effectively. Um, you really should look at these pairwise confidences, these PAEs, you'll often see blocks of structures where we understand well within that structure, how it's oriented and are much less confident between it. We do find side chains are predicted well, and you know, well is still measurable, but only when the backbone is predicted really well. We think that the side chains and alpha fold just really arise from local geometric and chemical constraints. Um, we've also noticed that often just a very few interactions can be the difference between success and failure in an alpha fold prediction. And we think that it's really propagating and resolving these constraints highly efficiently and locally. Um, and kind of toward the end of the network using physical and geometric constraints well, but globally it does not understand uh, global free energy. And I can talk a little bit about why that might be, but it definitely doesn't understand point mutations very well. It can locally adapt the structure, but not globally to these mutations. Now, of course, uh, we've made a lot of predictions. This is our increase in coverage uh, for the human proteome relative to both experimental structures and um, I don't remember the exact identity cutoff, but uh, good template modeling relative to those structures. And you can see we still add a lot of coverage, including in membrane proteins and other species, but, or sorry, in other classes, but it brings a kind of very important question. What should we think about everything else? What should we think about disorder, complexes and interactions, interaction networks, and what about everything else? Ligands, cofactors, nucleic acids, PTMs. How is all of this reflected? How dare we predict the whole proteome without any context, right? but that's the only choice you have at scale. And so uh, talking about a few of those, scariest moment in the project uh, is we started, we had alpha fold, we, did, we were pretty sure we did grading cast, but I'm not sure if we had the results yet. Okay, let's just go predict lots and lots of structures. And we start predicting lots of human proteo proteins and they look like this. And that is definitely not how structures in the PDB look. <laughs> and I, I may, have been, I may have gotten a PhD in a biophysics group, but I'm not a very good biologist, but I know that's not a protein structure, uh, at least not a structure that would appear in PDB. And uh, we, we thankfully started immediately, you know, after a few days, someone checked this against Uniprot and noticed that these corresponded well to Uniprot disorder annotations. And we started to do more analysis. And in fact, um, even better analysis was done externally by Belint uh, and Norman who worked on IUPRED and uh, found out that actually uh, AlphaFold not only, it has to express, has to put the atom somewhere. So it makes these little ribbon diagrams uh, for disordered regions, but also the presence of uh, low confidence and especially some drive measures from it are very competitive disorder predictions uh, at or near state of the art. So really we're getting to the point at which lack of structure is evidence of disorder, at least disorder in isolation uh, for these chains. Now, what we don't have is a statement about the Boltzmann ensemble for these. This is a more complex question, and then it will become an even more complex question if you try and answer in vivo. Now, what about interactions? Um, and of course, we built, we, there were two parts to this story as well. Um, so we had been, while, the paper, while we were waiting for the paper to come out, we had been building a protein interaction train system on complexes from the PDB. Um, but when the paper came out, a bit of a surprise is that people found out, well, if you just put in the regular alpha fold system with a bunch of glycines in the middle, that's also a, uh, a quite good protein interaction predictor. 
but it is better if you train for it. And we think there's more room to improve on this task. You can see for PDB complexes, we are successful at around two thirds of these. We think there's room for this to improve. And we think that this will become a more and more important area. And we're starting to really see, actually, I'll jump ahead and then I'll jump back. I'll jump back. Ah. And we're seeing this being exploited at scale by external groups. Uh, the Baker group um, has done some really excellent work, as has the Ellison group, that you can start to think about high throughput interaction screening as providing these chains to AlphaFold, asking for a structure, and then saying that you believe more in the interactions that have a confident pair. And this is, they believe, highly enriching. We can find new interactions really good at sorting some high throughput methods like um, affinity purification mass spec and really that we're going to start and we can start to think about using these to define more and more of the human interactome and start to get confidence on the set of interactions in humans although i think it will take some time to deal with basically since specificity issues especially the other kind of really exciting thing which i'm probably not telling anyone in the audience at this point is that uh, this pairs really really well with uh, cryo-EM and cryo-ET, and especially because of this kind of bottom-up property that it's defining local interactions, but it's worse at domain packing or less often confident on domain packing, but that's the exact regime in which cryo-EM and cryo-ET are great, and so we're seeing really impressive examples in which we're kind of both confirming the alpha-fold structure and adding mechanistic detail, including uh, this uh, incredible example of the nuclear pore. And so we're really seeing, and I think we're going to see a lot more hybrid and integrative methods in the future using this and finding the right way to do it. And one of the interesting parts is that really the manual adjustment into these, I'm sure it will become more automated, but the manual adjustment into these maps has worked quite well. Now, the kind of last and interesting point is, um, you know, thinking about AlphaFold is a system that in a sense works in the Infantson paradigm. You put in a sequence and you get out the structure. And this is obviously a completely un underspecified uh, question, right? Under what oligomeric state, what ligands were bound, you know, under what pH, multiple conformations, everything. And the answer has to be that the network is somewhat resistant to this being underspecified. So, for example, it's not that AlphaFold produces APO structures, it produces what it thinks would be the structure deposited in PDB. If it's a heme binding protein, you would expect it to leave room for the heme and in fact have coordinating histidines, and we do see that. And so you see really what we have is not state control. You can't ask it, well, how would this be different with and without the ligand? But you shouldn't assume that the structures you get back are um, the, the APO structures. And it actually is quite interesting, and one of the ones that was absolutely kind of unbelievable to us when we started seeing it is things like intertwined um, intertwined tri trimers being predicted very well. And this prediction was done not with the multimer system, but just with the uh, plain alpha fold system, which almost undoubtedly realized that this is the kind of pattern consistent with this loose packing. Obviously, wouldn't know that the existence of oligomers, but this is consistent with an oligomer type structure, and that seems to work really well. And that's very, very important at, for working at the genome scale, because at the genome scale, you just can't hope to fully specify conditions. And then, of course, as you know, we build more systems like Multimer, which, for example, we do see that, you know, if you give a dimer or trimer to a regular alpha fold system that's trained to ignore oligomer state context, then it will do well. If you give it to the Multimer system and say it's a monomer, then it will often give a different prediction because giving a single chain means that it's not a homomer for that system. And we think, I think this is also probably one of the reasons in which the network can't be very good at global free energies. Without knowing all these factors, it makes no sense to talk about the stability of the protein, right? You can say, okay, a, you know, an asp in the middle should unfold it and AlphaFold often misses that. But in general, it's trying to A, pick out the functional state, the one encoded in the MSA, and B, it has no idea what could be holding that together. And so it probably doesn't reason about global free energy. Now, that being said, there are interesting still things you can do. There's been some nice studies that, for example, AlphaFold will leave uh, often a place for you to insert your own, bring your own uh, glycosylation. 
And there's uh, the lovely name, the case for post-predictional modifications in the AlphaFold database. And uh, there's been some nice work, AlphaFill and others, on doing that. And then also using it to map the structural context of various uh, PTMs. And I, this was done, I think, at the Man Lab. I, ah, I forgot the lab for that. But we're seeing quite a lot in which we can use this in protein scale and bioinformatics and starting to emphasize, in my view, this kind of view that, oh, sorry, goes the wrong way, um, view that really we're entering an age, and for, certainly for bioinformatics, where if you're doing it in protein coding regions, you're, you always have the choice to use structure. And so we should really be thinking about how can we redo all the tools of bioinformatics with structural context and sequence context, you get all this and more, but it's really going to be, oh, that's the old 100 million number, but you, but it will really be a challenge to process these at the kind of scales we have now. And even if you do homology reduction, we now have to process structures at enormous scale. There have been some cool tools like FoldSeq that help us do it. We do also think, and the whole field is going to see improved coverage of interactomes, conformational states. There are quite a lot of natural problems where I would say AlphaFold, the particular piece of software you download and use, doesn't do it yet, but we have every reason to believe that the ideas applicable to structure prediction are also just as applicable to, you know, we know it's just as applicable to multimer, and then confirmations, interactions, interactions with nucleics, there's been a lot of work on that recently and nucleic structure prediction. And then there's this other kind of big boogeyman of uh, what are we going to do about mutational effects? And I think we'll see a lot of progress on this, but I think this will require more work and more careful thought about exactly what we want to predict and measure. So in the kind of zooming out a little bit, how should we think about the interplay with deep learning in the future? And I like to think of deep learning as an amplification system and a way to complete kind of sparse pictures. So you'd start from, you know, incredibly uh, carefully collected uh, experimental data, right? That often doesn't cover the things you want. Maybe you really need that box today. Um, and really by doing deep learning, you're filling out these pictures. And I think we'll see this over and over again. And we're gonna to start to see more experiments designed to fill out and train deep learning models such that we have very general tools. And I think it will be really exciting as we build out more and more toolbox of problems in which you can probably get really good answers and really good predictions, but we are gonna to have to find a way. It is worth, as people like to point out, there's only one PDB, it's incredible. It's incredible foresight. Um, by both the people that made it and the funding bodies to require it, we don't have many resources of that quality. And so we're going to have to think either about how to build more of these over years, or we're going to have to think about how we build our experiments in order to enable um, deep learning. And really importantly, if you want to think about what deep learning can do, is mostly it will work within kind of the box you can draw around the data you collected. Now, that doesn't mean rare things will always be badly predicted. For example, membrane proteins are relative. Oh, this thing is a little bit uh, touchy. Um, membrane proteins are, for example, somewhat rare in PDB, less so now. Uh, AlphaFold still predicts them well. But if we trained only on GPCR structures, for example, and we had 100,000 GPCR structures, we'd probably be bad at kinases. So we really have to think about what's the kind of radius of data or classes of data on which we can collect these. And I think that'll be one of the really interesting challenges to see how far we can push this. With that, I want to thank everyone who made AlphaFold possible. I want to especially thank uh, the team at Imbol, uh, who are partners on releasing the AlphaFold database. And the fact that it is useful to experimental biologists is due to their uh, both good work and good advice, and also really incredible that they scaled it up uh, 200 fold with basically no changes. I uh, very, very much want to thank uh, the experimental community who deposited in PDB, who made this possible, probably many of you in the room, uh, have some influence on the alpha fold weights, and uh, of course the wider team at DeepMind and CAS. Thank you. So uh, some of us were uh, old enough to have done experimental work on protein folding in the last century, Next. where we studied small model systems and measured energetics. Is that is that reservoir of information of mutational effects? Is it possible that AlphaFold could be adapted to utilize that at all? 
to some extent. I think if you look at the number of, say, computational alanine scans, it wasn't just, you know, last century. I mean, you know, I, I was in Tobin Sosnick's lab. He was still doing good work on this. But, um, but I think it is still a challenge to get the diversity that if, I bet if you look at the number of proteins where you have really clean mutational folding data, it'll be 20 or something of that order. And I think that's the real challenge that even if you have lots of measurements and lots of clean measurements on those 20, that's probably not enough to build a generalizable system on it, but we will see. So have you ever think to add lipids to your proteins and see the interactions? So we could, there aren't many lipids in the PDB that are resolved. So it's not, a, it's not an entirely physical system. So I'm not sure how well it would be constrained. You could certainly think about how to add I, all right, what I will say is certainly we'll, we will add more like classes of interactions and everything else. Whether, how well those work, I think, will be an interesting question. But yeah, I've certainly thought about it. As, as a physicist, how do you think physics-based simulations will play out with deep learning in the coming years? Are you working on models that can learn protein physics from MD simulations? So... Uh, for the, for the people that don't know the context, I actually spent uh, three years as a professional MD developer. Um, one thing I will say about, I will say two things. One thing I will say about MD is like, to put it in the proper place in the landscape, MD is a very interesting class of machine learning model, right? We have many parameters. We set them in a very different way. We, we set them from matching quantum data and then fine tuning them on things like helicities of small peptides. But it is ultimately, let's say, I, so one way I think about the alpha fold work and like even in my like thesis, I was working on like coarse grained MD learned from PDB data. And I would think of that as, you know, mostly MD and a bit more machine learning than most people do. And then we went to the other extreme and said, well, let's go do alpha fold, which is mostly ML and then putting in a bit of protein physics. And I think we'll continue to see methods and there are other groups in literature like the, the Nori and Clementi labs and others that are really trying to find that middle. I think we'll see a lot of that. I do think it's an interesting question of, will that be the way we answer questions we wanted to answer about multiple confirmations or will we just train a multiple confirmation alpha fold or some of the others? And I think there will always be this kind of tension on learning directly from MD. I think it would depend on what you want to do because MD itself isn't truth. So you're taking a imperfect model and then, distill, and then making an approximation of it. So you will have challenges there. And then you're going to want to improve that. So I think, honestly, all of these ideas will be tried. I'm not sure whether or not they will win. There's certainly going to be good research done on them. Thank you, John. Nice talk. Amazing talk. I was wondering that considering GPCR uh, conformational states are usually a continuum of energy landscape. So what is our current bottleneck for understanding these conformational states in terms in with respect to the machine learning parameters? Or so... All right, I think there's, for one thing, I would want to cut that into two questions. Sure. One is, you know, in the energy landscape, can you provide me examples of the minima, right? The different states geometrically, like the kind that may be deposited in PDB. And then how are they regulated by ligands, uh, mutations, et cetera? So on the first question, there's actually some nice work out of the FIG lab, which showed basically kind of, you know, the fine field of alpha fold hacking where they didn't provide an MSA, but then did provide a template in an alternative state of the GPCR for a different GPCR, then they can often get very accurate structures of that state. So there are ways to push alpha fold to produce these states. And I think we'll get better at multi-state alpha fold um, in general. I think the second question of what about regulation by ligands and other things, sometimes it's obvious, right? Sometimes you don't have space for the ligand in one of your states, but otherwise, I think we'll have to be really precise about what we want to measure. And I think it will end up being something like delta delta Gs or something else, like sure. what exactly we're looking for. And I think maybe this is an example of where things like CASP are important is I don't think the community is centered on one question of dynamics or energetics. I don't even think we would recognize the solution totally if we, if we had one yet. And I think sure. it's a case in which the biological and experimental communities could do more to say, well, this is really what I would want to know the answer to. And I think I think that will help. So if my understanding is right, you mean to say that we are right now not asking the right questions to which we can find an answer to. 
we're not, I think we're not being clear enough on here's a hundred examples of what I wanted to say. And, you know, I, I like to tell people like the best way to interact with a machine learning um, is not really to say, here's a data set, go do your machine learning thing. It's to say, here's 10 or a hundred examples. And here's, and when you can get a system to do that, come back to me and I promise I'll care. Sure. Right. Yeah. Tell me what you'll care about. And I think, for example, for GPCRs, you might say, well, here are the mutations that upregulate these different states or change the activity. You know, when you can tell me that, come back and I'll care. Or maybe it's, well, I really wanted to see this alternative structure and really I wanted to know about this interaction. Like when we were developing AlphaFold, at one point we, we thought we were doing pretty well. And so we said, you know what, if this is really a good system, then sometimes it should be able to replace experiments. So we'll just go get some nature cell and science papers and that announced new structures and said they learned something and we'll run the sequences through AlphaFold and would we have learned the same thing? And the first time we did it, the answer was a resounding no, right? The general structures look pretty good. The cartoon looks good. And when they say, oh, we learned about this very cool interaction, we wouldn't have that. And then after a whole bunch more like accuracy improvements and tweaks, then the answer was yes. And that's a lot of work to do, but I think the experimental community really should define what they want in a really crisp way. And then we can at least know that we're not there yet. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two more questions, but uh, quick questions. Th th here. Thank you very much. I was wondering, um, where would you put alpha phones predictions uh, in the context of, let's say, Jeffrey Skolnick's work, where he says that there is a limited number of fold space and how many hmm. new folds can you come up with? So I don't, I don't really like the fold space arguments. And the reason I don't like them, first of all, we did a study that unfortunately we put this graph in the, S, in the SI of the paper and we should have put it in the main part. But alpha fold is basically no worse at novel folds than known folds. So if we take things that announced no, where the fold was not known as of our training cutoff, alpha fold is no worse. So this kind of fold recognition argument seems invalidated by that analysis. I think it's also kind of assuming a top-down global, a fold is somewhat of a human construction of like, how do we look at this? Whereas AlphaFold is operating pretty bottom-up in local interactions. And I think that, and I think from that point of view, fold is not the most relevant concept for how it understands and builds structures. Okay, and the final question from online, please. Fine. So Julia Palermo is interested in understanding the meaning of the predicted alignment error. Is it the error between predicted and true structures? But the true structures have to be predicted. Maybe you can explain. Yes. Okay, so there's two parts to this and I really appreciate the question. First of all, if you measure any error between a predicted structure and a true, true structure, then you can put P in front of it and you can predict what that number is. Right, so you you can you can measure the RMSD between the true structure only in training when you know the answer, right? Then you can produce a structure, and this is in fact how these systems are trained. Is that uh, is at training it produces a prediction, and we know the right answer, so we measure the distance, and it produces a second output which basically gets a penalty for how far it is away from the error, and so and so the Predicted aligned error is a prediction of aligned error, which I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Oh, well, actually, I'll tell you what that is. So the aligned error is if you take the true structure, and you can only do this at training, but that's okay, and you align it to the predicted structure, and you align it on residue I only, so just the NC alpha C, you could do that in pi mole, then you would see an error in every other atom. Now, if you're in the same domain, the errors are probably small, right? Because everything with a domain has a coherent orientation. If you're in two domains with unknown orientations, probably quite big. And so for each I, for each J, that's if you aligned on I, what's the error on J? We measure that at training, and then we have an additional output that predicts it, which at training we can score. So what the PAE means is in the hypothetical case in which this was deposited in PDB next week, this is what I think my error would be on this aligned error metric. And the same thing is true of PLDDT, is it has that very long name because of a uh, uh, the local distance difference test, which is the LDDT, which is a standard error measure in the structure prediction community. And so very much encourage you to look at and think about how these errors uh, look. And actually it was really interesting work from the Marcotte lab 
showing that if you look at PIE, it's highly predictive of whether you will violate a chemical crosslink in vivo. And so there's been some nice work on that relationship. 